I'm uh, Sean Gawley, CTO and co-founder of Quid. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's, it's brand new science. I mean, look, the first paper just got published at the end of 2009. So, you know, we're, we're right at the start of a new academic discipline. Um, so, you know, it's that's the first thing I'd say in, in, in that case. Um, the second thing I think is, um, you know, there's mathematical structure in conflict, um, absolutely, which means we can predict likelihood of attacks, we can predict how the uh, certain region will scale up in violence or scale down. We're just starting to get information about how wars come to an end. You know, the reality is we've only got two or three different conflicts that have happened in recent times. We can start to see how they finish. You know, um, I think that so, you know, what does that mean? It means, you know, we're starting to understand these things as very much version 1.0. Um, we do know more now about how insurgencies work, um, how the dynamics of insurgents make decisions, how they allocate resources, how they um, you know, fragment and coalesce as they evolve. So there's, there's a lot more learning now than even four years ago when the first papers came out. And the information landscape's changed. So I, I, I do think we're going to be in a, in, a, in a sort of a brave new space um, with regards to war, um, albeit we know we've just taken the first step. Yeah, so the, you know, absolutely, the U.S. Um, government agencies are using the software. Um, beyond that, I can't say exactly what they're doing or how they're doing um, with it. Um, but this, um, you know, with is definitely part of of their toolkit. Um, and the mathematical structures now, you know, they're open and available, and certainly, you know, they're part of the uh, the courses that are taught at um, at the U.S. training army institutions. Um, you know, you should absolutely be right. You know, the information that you share um, is is collected and stored and um, can be accessible um, by governments. Um, you know, so that should very much factor into what you do. It hasn't factored into what we do, um, you know, largely because, um, you know, we I don't think we fully understand it. Um, I think we've still got the old paradigm of you sit down and, and the information's kind of stored on a hard drive and it's yours. Um, once you move up into the cloud, um, you know, it's shared by everyone and so security becomes very important. Who can have eyes on that? Um, one of the interesting dichotomies is we're very happy to share information with corporations. Um, Facebook uh, will we'll give them our lives effectively. Um, but the idea that that might be used by a government, now we've got problems. So do we really trust a corporation more than we trust a government? And um, you know, why? Um, so I think that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, that's, that's something for us as a society to think about, but collectively we've decided to live our lives online and share the information that goes with that. And I don't think we really realize the full implications of what that means. You know, the, the idea that, that um, we should have uh, blind faith in corporations, I think history would tell us, um, you know, that, that blind faith uh, is, is perhaps uh, misguided. You know, we, we need to regulate um, companies and what they can do and, and, and how they can do it. And, um, you know, they need to be given rules to operate within. Um, and they're generally pretty happy once that's been done. But we as a society have to stand up and say that. And, you know, one of the things that comes from that is, is saying, you know, there should be a, um, you know, a service of, of a social network or an email program which doesn't share your information with third parties, which doesn't share it with governments, which, you know, when you put the information up there, it's yours and you decide where it goes. Now, of course, you can't have that for free. The only reason you've got things for free is because they sell you to the rest of the world. So you'll have to pay for that. Um, and the question is, are we willing to pay 20 bucks a year to have that? Or do we not really care? And I think that's a moot point. Look, we, um, you know, I pay $7.95 for Netflix. I pay uh, $15 for audio subscription for radio. Um, you know, I pay $4 coffees. Um, you know, there's a certain class of people that will absolutely pay for it. Um, and given the chance, they would, they would do it, no doubt. Um, it tends to be the more educated people realize, you know, what's at stake here. I think, you know, perhaps what may transpire is we actually see a segregation of um, socioeconomic um, uh, groups and that the rich people start to have services that they pay for and the poor people have ones where their information is given out. Um, the ads that they're seeing, the content that they get is manipulated and, um, you know, manipulated for them to kind of purchase more. So we may see a segregation of the internet being a, um, a paid for and a not paid for 
uh, proportion. Do you think that could be a dangerous thing? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, um, you know, I think that's what one of the one of the things the internet has done has been one size fits all. You know, we forget that Google is whether you you know a, you know a, a kid in Mexico um, or a, you know the, the the head of United States military, you've got the same Google, um, and that's that's quite revolutionary. Um, you know, and they've done that off the back of advertising. Um, the world doesn't have to be like that, and traditionally it hasn't been like that. You have different models for different payment prices. Um, I think, you know, all, all these organizations, um, you know, they're, they're just massive, I think, for the start. I think we can't realize how, how big they are. Um, and there's inertia that moves through the system. And, um, you know, the idea that you can kind of, um, that there's one entity even. You know, the United Nations isn't one entity. Um, or, you know, so the Pentagon certainly isn't one entity. Um, I think learning with them is, um, you know, what are, what are the learning with, with them is? <laughs> that's a good question. What have I learned by working with the governments? Well, one is I don't want a job in government, um, I think is the, first, <laughs> is the first thing. And I think that comes down to inertia. Um, and, and the second is, um, you know, there can be some great people in these government agencies um, that, are, you know, are really trying to do good things, um, whether it's, it's trying to set up universities in Iraq or it's, it's trying to, you know, bring the soldiers, you know, that they have sent to uh, Afghanistan, bring them home safely, or, or, you know, trying to, you know, figure out drug trafficking, you know, in the United Nations. So, you know, they're, they're trying to do good work. It's just, you know, incredibly complicated. And they're not only battling an incredibly complex world, they're battling, you know, a huge amount of bureaucracy and inertia within the organizations they function. So, you know, may, maybe that's the next project is to figure out how to make large corporations and organizations work effectively. But it's probably beyond me. <laughs> I'll stick to war. Um, you know, look, I, I, I think uh, having a Kiwi... Um, being a Kiwi making money is nice to make it big regardless. Um, but, you know, being, being a Kiwi to make it big, um, you know, you sort of come from the edge of the world and you sort of go out and explore the rest of the, the, rest of the world and, you know, you sort of follow your interests and, um, you know, things sort of fall together. I sort of feel kind of lucky sometimes. It sort of doesn't, doesn't really know how it all happened. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs>